Hey everybody, hope you're having a lovely Doomer day. I just recently picked me up a copy of Hot House Earth from my local library. It's the first hard copy in my hands that they received from the publisher. Some of my subscribers have already read this in digital format, but it's my first time going through it. What do I feel about the book? Um, it's well written, concise, very thorough, informative. Basically, if you have a high school level of reading and comprehension skills, then you can get through it. It's not too difficult to read in 160-something pages. A perfect book to just hand to someone who may not be conscious right now. Um, they'll get through it pretty quickly. It's frightening, though. It is frightening. And I guess the only complaint I have is, is he's going off the information that is... Um, standardized, I guess you could say, or ac agreed upon by by nations, by the UN, um, the IPCC, for instance, which isn't giving wrong information per se, but it's being extremely conservative, to say the least. So he throws out dates like 2100, and we all know that's a farce, even 2050. So keep that in mind as I read a couple paragraphs and out of chapters I picked out here that uh, things are ramping up and getting warmer and worse faster. And as the science comes out, there's always a lag between what we study and what's reviewed and published for us layman folk. So as informative as it is, as well written as it is, um, it's, just a, it's just a tad out of line with the true gravity of the situation. And he does mention that. He says... He talks about tipping points. He talks about, um, yeah, glaciers re retreating, um, all of the earth science factors. He mentions them. He covers them in a couple pages, but he also mentions there's a lot of degree of uncertainty because we've never been here before. We've never seen such dramatic geological change occur to our planet in such a rapid amount of time than ever in Earth's geologic history. Okay, so keep that in mind. As I read a couple of these paragraphs, he's, he's being conservative, but it's still extremely frightening on the basis of what is being told. And the prose is very relaxed. It's very, you know, sit down on the couch. This is what's happening. This is the effects. This is what we can expect. You know, one, two, three. It's very simple. So again, I'm going to read a couple paragraphs, a couple pages that I found noteworthy. The whole book is good. You might find things that are more interesting to you, but I found these paragraphs kind of as a, a, a good visual imagery, especially the last part. Stick around to the end. In his last chapter, he paints out a scene of London with and without um, dramatic climate breakdown, and basically he's describing collapse. He's describing a 28 days later apocalypse, last of us type situation and in and, and publicized format, which is, and it's well done. It's well done. So the first section I'd like to read is from chapter three, hot and steamy with a chance of collapsing ice sheets. Okay. In subtext, Earth's climate today. On the 29th, June, 2021, the unassuming Canadian village of Lytton in Southern British Columbia registered an astonishing temperature of 49.6 degrees Celsius or 121 degrees Fahrenheit, beating the previous record for the highest temperature ever recorded in the country by a huge margin of almost 5 degrees Celsius. It was also the highest temperature ever recorded north of the 50th parallel, and hotter than anything ever experienced in Europe and South America. The following day, the village was gone, wiped from the face of the earth by one of the many wildfires triggered by searing temperatures. Barely two weeks later, on 12th of July, a slow-moving line of thunderstorms dumped on a month's, a month's worth of rain on London, bringing widespread flash flooding and caused sewers to back up and travel chaos. But far worse was to follow. Over the next three days, the same low-pressure system called over east, eastern Belgium, Luxembourg, and western Germany. Warm, moist air sucked up from the south, fed a biblical deluge that brought the worst floods in a thousand years. To some parts of the region, an unprecedented and shocking scenes as the power of water devastated Wilof communities and the heart of Europe. Without warning, the wild weather cultivated by global heating 
wasn't battered some distant land, but taking its awful toll across the channel. Suddenly, it was too close for comfort, all too easy to imagine the images of ravaging torrents, stranded corpses, and demolished homes transposed on our communities. More than a thousand lives were lost as a direct consequence of the North American heat wave, while European floods took close to 250 lives and caused a damage totaling in excess of 11 billion. But these instances were just two in a long line of extreme weather events in 2021 that destroyed lives and livelihoods right across the planet. Devastating floods also swamped great tracts of Turkey, China, Japan, India, Pakistan, United States, and New Zealand. Meanwhile, some of the greatest wildfires ever seen raged across Siberia and California, while record-breaking droughts became even further entrenched across the western United States, Central and Southern Africa. It was not only Canada that experienced unparalleled heat, all-time temperature records were shattered across much of North America and Southern Europe. Sicily smashed European record with 120 degrees Fahrenheit, while the heat in California's appropriately named Death Valley touched 130 degrees Fahrenheit, or 54.4 degrees Celsius, the highest temperature ever reliably measured on the planet. The reality is then that we don't need to look beyond our news feeds and TV screens to build a picture of climate breakdown today. With relatively small rise in global average temperature can only be detected using instrumentation, its ramifications in the form of extreme weather events are now out there for all to see. I I can hear the more skeptical among you pointing out that there have always been bouts of severe weather and always will be. This is true, but the fact that weather records are being broken left, right, and center at a record, in fact, tells us that something unusual is at work here. Furthermore, it is now possible to calculate how likely a particular weather event would have been with and without global heating. The 2021 European floods, for example, were nine times more likely to occur in a world where global heating had never happened. Even more clear-cut, the extraordinary heat dome that roasted much of Western North America during the early summer of 2021 would have been virtually impossible in a world where human activities have not artificially pumped up atmospheric carbon levels. In fact, this unprecedented heat wave is one in a 1,000-year event made 150 times more likely by global heating. It is a disturbing thought that fully 70% or more than 400 extreme weather events analyzed by researchers were found to have been made more likely or more severe as a result of global heating. Perhaps the most worrying thing about the obvious boost in frequency and intensity of unprecedented weather events is that this is being driven by a relatively small temperature rise. The past eight years to 2022 have been the hottest ever recorded. While the global average temperature over the past 20 years exceeded one degree Celsius more than Arkwright's time, Evidence that global heating doesn't stand still is provided the fact that temperature rise in 2021 was a full 1.2 above pre-industrial times. But the hike in global average temperature is far from the whole story. No part of Earth environment has been shielded from the effects of global heating, and the assessment reports released by the IPCC check off the manifold consequences of the modest rise in temperature that have become apparent so far. It is no surprise that the heat waves have become more intense and are lasting longer as a hotter atmosphere contains more water in the form of vapor. Rainfall across the land has increased as our world heated up and more rain as is falling as intense downpours so that the evidence of serious flooding is rising too. Storm tracks have migrated to higher latitudes while heating of the oceans has increased their potential to spawn more and drive more powerful hurricanes. Hotter seas are also taking their toll on coral reefs. In a land, many species are struggling to keep up with relentless poleward march of climate and vegetation zones up to 10 kilometers of a year as temperature at a particular latitude rise ever higher. This is leading to enforced migration and dietary changes, breeding issues, problems with pollination, and in many cases, diminishing numbers. As would be expected, glaciers across the world have gone into rapid retreat, and the area covered by the Arctic sea ice has diminished by up to 40% since the 1980s. The rate of sea level rise is now 5 millimeters a year, reflecting accelerating melting of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets and the tendency of the oceans to take up more space due to thermal expansion. 
half a centimeter may not may sound like peanuts, but it's getting on four times the 1900 and 1990 rate and continuing rapid acceleration could see far a higher figure within a few decades. Taken together, all this tells us is that climate breakdown is not something that belongs to the distant future. On the contrary, it is here with us today. It is no exaggeration to say that the speedy, speedy burgeoning of severe weather reveals that our climate is on the very cusp of radical change that will transform our planet so extreme, hothouse conditions are common, commonplace. Just how extreme is entirely within our gift to determine. Unfortunately, society, civilization is a heat engine no matter how it's powered. Side note, I want to skip ahead to chapter 5, Food, Famine, and Flare-Ups. That was a little introductory course there to what is happening. Okay, so he begins this, just a preface, he begins this uh, chapter with what you'd expect. Uh, food, Famine, Flare-Ups, Meteorological Mayhem, and the Society on Edge. This is real societal collapse talk. So let me just read from uh, page 78. The UN World Food Program estimates that 41 million people in 43 countries were teetering on the edge of famine in 2021, up from 27 million in 2019. As global heating continues to accelerate and extreme weather becomes ever more common, this figure is only going one way. Climate breakdown is not yet sufficiently advanced to bring the prospect of widespread starvation to developed countries, but in late 2021, it's already having an impact through commodity shortages and price hikes. As crops succumb to extreme weather, most obvious is the sudden rise in pasta prices, reflecting the destruction of much of Canadian Durham wheat crop by extreme summer heat and drought. And if you like a nice glass of red to accompany your spaghetti bolognese, you may have to spend more on that too. Vineyards across Europe took a real battering from extreme weather in 2021, resulting in wine production plummeting by 27% in France and 25% in Spain. Add to this rocketing coffee prices due to severe wet weather wiping out a third of Brazil's crop and cocoa production in Africa hit by drought. The news for dinner party hosts is not good. And these are just a f the forerunners of the serious food supplies that will rise in a hotter world. The bottom line is that some crops will simply not grow under the higher temperatures that are becoming the norm. Many that can see yields fall away and others will be lost to extreme weather. In this regard, the cherries and blueberries that baked where they grew and apples that roasted on the trees during the 2021 North American heat wave should be regarded as early examples of the far more widespread crop damage to come. Bearing this out, a recent study forecast, forecast that by 2100, crop damage arising from extreme weather is set to increase as much as tenfold. We don't, however, need to wait until the end of the century. Even a global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius, which we are likely to see within a decade, will have a serious impact on food supplies. The big worry is that, uh, is that four-fifths of all calories consumed on the planet will world on the world come from 10 crop plants including the staples wheat maize and rice yield decreases for these key crops will thus have a disproportionate and massive impact on calorie intake particularly in a majority world countries already global maize production was down six percent in 2020 winter wheat down three percent and rice down by nearly two percent compared to the 1981 2010 average according to one study climate breakdown is now reducing consumable calories from the, from the 10 main crops by around 1%. This may not sound like much, but it represents a loss of 35 trillion calories a year, enough to feed more than 50 million people. By 2050, global production of maize is predicted to fall by almost a quarter, rice by 11%, and potatoes by 9%. Wheat fares a little better, falling by just 3 percentage points. But together, these figures point towards a massive reduction in consumable calories, which will have a catastrophic impact, especially in a majority world countries. And a footnote, for those who can't do without their cuppa, the main tea growing area in the world are set to be especially badly hit by severe weather, resulting in massive yield falls. Kenya, the world's biggest producer of black tea, which supplies almost half of the tea drunk in the UK, will see areas best suited to tea growing reduced by a quarter by the middle of the century, while areas that are marginally suited to production are likely to cut by almost 40%.
skipping ahead here a little bit, one paragraph. As heat, drought, and crop failures drive people from their homes and off their land, the number of economic migrants are forecasted to go through the roof. By 2050, more than 250 million people could be on the move across sub-Saharan Africa. 20 years later, fully a fifth of the planet could land may be effectively uninhabitable, provoking even higher numbers of migration. As large numbers of hungry and desperate people head for cities and across borders it is inevitable inevitable that civil order will become dis sorry it will become inevitable that civil disorder will become widespread and clashes between neighboring countries almost commonplace developed countries particularly the united states and uk those that make up the european union will without a doubt become target destinations of many of the uprooted causing an explosion in trafficking and modern slavery slavery bringing serious security problems surely promoting migration policy rethinks i'll explore the links on breakdown between food famine conflict and more detail and he goes on to that, the next chapter is about rising seas, mostly skipping over to chapter nine, health and well-being on an overheated planet. A few paragraphs in. Within 20 years, ferocious heat waves comparable with the worst experience to date will affect nearly 4 billion people every year, more than half the current population of the planet. In 2019, an estimated 302 billion hours of labor were lost worldwide as a consequence of increasing temperature, up more than 50% on two decades earlier. And this figure is expected to climb rapidly, severely impacting pro productivity and national economies. And its climate change assessment risk climate change risk assessment in 2021, the prestigious UK think tank Chatham House came up with a horrifying forecast that within 10 years, without immediate and drastic cuts to emissions, heat stress could prevent more than 400 million people from working outside. At the same time, every year, an estimated 10 million people could be exposed to extreme heat that exceeds, to sur to the, that exceeds the survivability threshold. The reality then is clear. We are facing a global health catastrophe. In its landmark report in 2009, the UCL Lancet Commission of, on Managing and Health Effects of Climate, of which I was a member, labeled climate change as the biggest health threat of the century. Prior to 2001 tw COP26 conference, 200 health journals published a joint editorial calling for world leaders to take emergency action on the climate change in order to protect health and well-being. The editorial pointed a figure at world leaders announcing that the greatest threat to global public health was their continued, continued failure to keep the global t average temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius and to restore nature. Inexcusably, the calls seems to have fallen on deaf, deaf ears. Heat stroke will, of course, be a major killer, but a hotter climate will also bring other challenges to health and well-being. For every 1 degree Celsius in global average temperature, the death rate due to respiratory illnesses rises by 10%. Cataracts will become increasingly common, while the cases of malignant melanoma are forecasted to be up 50% by 2040. There are less other less obvious threats too. For an estimated uh, estimated 33,000 people are now losing their lives annually due to pollution associated with the ever growing number of scale of wildfires, and that number is only rising. Those working in the ocean in the open air for extended periods, notably in the tropics and equatorial zone, will be at most at risk. The appalling treated migrant workers in the Qatar, for example, are often required to work in baking heat for eight hours a time, relieved by just a 30-minute break. And with little protection from the heat and humidity, it is hardly surprising that hundreds drop dead every year. Among the workers in the sugar plantations in Nicaragua, kid kidney disease has become endemic for generations. And it was only recently recognized as being a consequence of heat stress and insufficient consumption of water. Neither of those cities are off the hook. As touched up earlier, the heat island effect means that large built-up areas are typically several degrees hotter than the surrounding countrysides. But workers in urban factories that lack air conditioning will become increasingly at risk of heat stroke and related condition as the world gets hotter. People staying at home won't fare much better. Urban housing, both in developed and nations of the majority world, is simply not designed to handle the levels of temperature and humidity predicted by the middle of the century and beyond. In a survey of the administrators of 800 of the world's cities, almost half 
said they have no plans in place for adapting to the impacts of, of heating, many pointing out they simply do not have the funds to do so. Of course, um, there are also mental health issues. He goes on to, uh, to say in the next paragraph that um, for every one degree rise in C, one degree Celsius rise in ordinary uh, temperature rise on an ordinary day in the growing season resulted in 67 more suicides and a five degree Celsius increase in 335 additional self-inflicted deaths. So mental health, rain, um, suicide levels, um, diseases. I, I'm just pausing for a second, guys. You can see it's it's all conf it's all jumbling up together, right? It's a multifaceted problem from every angle. Probably the most most frightening thing is hunger, because people do crazy things when they're hungry. From the next segment called Hungry World, every night 800 million people go to sleep hungry. Most are in the majority world countries, but daily hunger is also rising in developed nation nations with huge and growing wealth disparities, such as the UK and the United States. Our world's population is not as rising as fast as it was. Nonetheless, it is predicted to be between 9 and 10 billion by the middle of the century, mostly driven by the growth in majority world countries, Africa and Asia. This is the very worst news, because at the same time, of a medley of higher temperatures, water stress, and extreme weather is forecasted to progressively reduce yields of staple crops. The shortages and price hikes caused by the unprecedented summer of 2021 are forerunners of what is to come, but provide little idea of the scale of future food production and problems, which is likely to be d devastating. In 2021, climate change risk assessment, Chatham House forecasts by, that by 2050, when an increased global population and growing demand will require 50% as much food again as today, agricultural yields could be down by almost one third. If realized, this nightmare scenario would mean nothing less than widespread and unprecedented famine and societal breakdown and conflict that would inevitably accompany it. And we can't say we've been warned. In recent years, regional harvest failures have become far more commonplace, and this trend is increasing. So you can go on more with the statistics there, but the point is clear. More people, less food equals societal breakdown. I'm going to skip ahead to the last chapter called The Big Questions in which case he paints a picture of the future going along one or two paths. One where we rapidly reduce emissions and change our entire in energy infrastructure, somehow make civilization not a heat engine, which is way out of the question. And the other situation where we continue along business as usual and nobody cares, there's no action, world leaders continue to ignore the problem, and this is where you end up. Again, he uses 2100 as the picture of this happening, but I would bump that up to probably 2030 or 2040. So, let's read it. The late August bank holiday of 2100 draw, dawns a hot and clear but there are no sign of Londoners attempting a quick getaway to reach nearby beaches or the countryside. In fact, the streets of London are all but empty. Those lucky enough to have air conditioning when the power is on are cloistered in their homes from the scorching heat. The thermometer is already touching 32 degrees Celsius and forecasted to reach 44 degrees Celsius later in the day. Those without access to air conditioning have either joined the exodus north to escape the terrible summer heat, are camp are camped out in the treeless and desiccated parks, or are sheltering in the shadows of the derelict streets. Now, no one buys property in London any longer, and those that own it can no longer sell it. In the south and east of the city, the sea has made deep inroads and shanties have grown up where coastal breezes takes coastal breeze that takes the edge off the heat and humidity. But there is a deadly price to pay in the form of an endemic cholera and malaria. This is a killing ground for other reasons too, as the indigenous destitute and the penniless migrants who have fled even warmer southern Europe and beyond scrabble violently to protect what little they have. In Westminster, the House of Parliament still stands, 
but the sound of debating has long gone, driven northwards, northwards to Carlisle by the smell of raw sewage flushed into the Thames by flash floods accompanying the evening thunderstorms. To the west, just one runway and a single terminal remain open at Heathrow Airport. Since this swinging personal carbon levies were imposed, a far too tardy response to try to slow climbing emissions, flying is a luxury only the very rich can afford. All around the city, the landscape is brown and parched, much of, much of the ancient water distribution system long ago succumbing to the settling and substances of the soils dried out, shattering mains and contaminating supplies. The motorways, motorways that head out from the city like the spokes of a wheel carry little traffic. Construction of the infrastructure to support electric vehicles never really got going. And since the recent economic crisis driven by the final collapse of the fossil fuel industry, the cost of fuel has been astronomical. As the sun climbs higher in the sky, a hot wind builds, ruffling the thick coast and coat and dust and brown topsoil that blanketed streets and buildings after six years of extreme drought. Carried aloft by air currents, it hangs like a gray cloud over the city, but does little to ease the sun's blazing light. Wow. So what he's painting here, a picture, is complete collapse, okay? Contaminated waterways, you can't even go outside. People won't be living in flats anymore. It'll just be, there won't be no supplies, no access to food. Um, it, it's pretty much a collapse scenario. That, that's what he's painting out there, just a, a dark, grim, dusty, hot version of London. And that's London. You know what I'm saying? What about less developed countries? These places you not, don't want to be. So, I hope you enjoyed this reading today, guys. I know it was a little lengthy of a video, but I highly recommend this book. P purchase it for any of your unconscious friends or family members, though everyone seems to be pretty aware that this is a problem. They're just catching up to the severity of it. And do mention that this is very conservative. Um, in its nature. There's still so much more we need to are learning about climate breakdown, which is all pervasive. Hope you enjoyed this reading. Hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Hope you guys have a lovely Doomer week. I'll talk to you soon. See ya.